Okay guys, in this video we're going to take a look at the exceptions to the octet rule and we're going to start with phosphorus and sulfur. Okay, Phosphorus and sulfur have this ability to actually expand their octet and what happens with that is they actually can go above that magic number of 8. They do that by utilizing the, an empty d orbital that's kind of available for them to put electrons into. So if you take a look at phosphorus, uh, if we look at its electron configuration or its dot structure I should say, it has five valence electrons around it. Now you normally wouldn't write it this way, but if we rewrite this as one, two, three, four, five, we actually have five different places that we can bond off of the phosphorus. Put my dot back in there. So with phosphorus, what it does, it actually allows you it to, uh, to expand up to 10 electrons within it. Now typically you see this done with halogens, where it actually would have something like uh, PCl5, where it actually would have um, one chlorine coming off of the phosphorus from all different sides. But you can also see this happen with oxygen in some of our polyatomic ions. Like, for example, for phosphate, like PO4, uh, 2 minus, where we actually can see that in this scenario, we will also see um, phosphate doing this. Now, the reason why we see this happening is because if we look at the formal charge on this PO4, uh, we actually can find a Lewis structure, or sorry, a resonance structure that's a little bit more stable for phosphorus if you have it in a set of five, okay? So if we add a little page here, and let's take a look at how that might look. So if you have phosphorus, if we put four oxygens around it, and we have our um, typical Lewis structure we would draw for that, we would say, well, we have you know, five bonds coming across from it, and phosphorus is a three minus charge, so phosphorus has five valence electrons on it. Each of our oxygens had six, so six times four is 24. Uh, since we have a three minus charge, we have three more additional electrons, so if we take 24 plus five plus three, that is 32 electrons to work with. So you may think that you would just do this, And then, of course, we bracket it because it is a negative 3 charge. And you say, yep, I'm done. I satisfy my octet rule. Everything is good. Well, here's a problem. Phosphorus, if you take a look at the formal charges now on this, um, take oxygen, for example. Oxygen starts off as 6 valence electrons. We're going to subtract 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 for the unshared electrons and subtract one more. So oxygen, in this case, is a negative 1 and all sides. Oops. Negative one, negative one, negative one. And phosphorus, it starts off as a five, and we gotta subtract away four, so it is a plus one. Okay, so phosphorus here is a plus one. Now that works out because if you look, we have four negative ones and a plus one, so it ends up being negative three, so it does match our charge. However, if, let's just say, I decide to take away these two electrons here, and I decided to get rid of those. Okay, I can't erase those. I thought I could, but for some reason I am not allowed to. Um, <clears throat> so let's just say we remove those. Electrons. I'll just cheat by putting white over it. Uh, and instead of that, what we do is we put in a double bond here for the phosphorus. Now if we do that, if you take a look, that changes a few things. No longer is the octet rule satisfied for phosphorus, but that's okay because phosphorus we say can expand up to 10. And if you look now, it has 10, right? It has 1, 2, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So it can expand to 10, but let's see what happens to our formal charges. So phosphorus was a plus 1, but now because it is a 5 minus 5, phosphorus now becomes a 0. So this is no longer a plus 1. This is now a 0. Same thing for the oxygen. The oxygen was a minus 1, but now with the double bonds in it, it becomes a 0. So if you look in terms of formal charges, 
by giving phosphorus this double bond, we are actually improving its formal charge. So this is the most likely resonance structure for phosphate. Okay, so one thing you have to remember with sulfur and phosphate is check if you move to a double bond on that molecule, will that improve the formal charge? And it usually happens with our polyatomic ions like sulfate and phosphate, or we see it happening with things like this, our PCL5, where we have five uh, chlorines coming around the phosphorus. Okay, now the same thing happens. Um, with sulfur, so if you take a look at sulfur, we basically the same thing happens. Sulfur starts off with six valence electrons, so sulfur can actually go out six different ways to bond, so it can have a magic number of 12 electrons on it, okay? So with 12 electrons for sulfur, it now can bond that way, which then also changes how we do uh, some of its bonding. So you can actually get things like sulfur with six fluorines on it, okay? And if we take a look at how that would look for, let's say, sulfate, SO4, 2 minus. Again, if you do the math on that, we have 32 electrons to work with. So your instinct, remember our worksheet from the other day, would be to make sulfate look like this. Bracket, of course. 2 minus. But if we again go back to formal charges, oxygen here would be a 6, minus 6, minus 1. So it's a negative 1, negative 1, negative 1, negative 1. And sulfur on here, it's a 4. So it's already being a 6 minus 4. It's actually a plus 2, which is really not a good thing for a molecule to be a plus 2. So, we, of course, we fix that where we go in and we say, well, if I... Instead, put a couple of double bonds in, and I get rid of those electrons there. And now we look at our new formal charges for sulfate and phosphate again. Uh, we see that now sulfur is a zero because it's six minus six, and these two oxygens over here are both zeros also. So the formal charge is better. So this is a better way to do sulfate in terms of our... Uh, um, process. Now, that means you have to let sulfur have 12 electrons, which is an exception to our octet rule, but it can do that, okay? So that's your phosphorus and your sulfur. Um, so here's just a couple examples of things we're looking at. One, the PCO5, and then the sulfate. So how that kind of looks. Now, uh, along the same token, if you take a look at boron, boron has what we call a reduced octet. So if we take a look at boron and what that kind of looks like, um, remember, boron starts off with only three valence electrons around it. So it's never going to get to eight when it shares electrons and bonds. What it's going to do is just going to share those three electrons. So things like BF3 exist in a stable form because boron will single bond to these different fluorines. And if we put our electrons around properly, we get that, okay? Check our formal charges. Boron starts off as a three. We're gonna subtract three for the bond, so it's a zero. All the fluorines are seven minus seven, so they're all zeros. So even though their octet isn't satisfied for boron, it only has six electrons, that's okay for boron. So boron, we say it reduces its octet, and we only end up having six electrons on boron, okay? Now, we touched base on this a little bit in a previous video, but if you have an odd number of electrons, okay? So for example, with NO2, with NO2, because we have more than one possible Lewis structure there, we have to decide where do we put this single electron, okay? So if we take a look at um, this particular example, why did I choose to put this single electron here instead of putting it over here or on the nitrogen? What's my choice here? So the, way, the reason why you choose that, again, you go back to formal charges. So the place you place the single electron is the place it puts it to make your formal charges the best. So if we take a look at this, written up this way, where oxygen is single bonded to nitrogen to a double bond, uh, like such, and we do our formal charges here, this oxygen is a zero, this nitrogen it's 5 minus 3 minus 2, so it's a 0. This oxygen, if you look at it, it's actually 6 minus the 5 for the unshared and minus 1, so it's also a 0. 
So all of these are zeros for this molecule. If we were to switch this around and we put the double bond or the, the single electron someplace else, so let's say, for example, we put the single electron over here and put two electrons over there and said, okay, now what are we going to do with this? Because we put the single electron here. If we recalculate the charge for nitrogen dioxide here, we end up with nitrogen still being a zero. This oxygen now ends up being a negative one, and this one ends up being a plus one, which is not preferred, okay? So we use formal charges to help us out with that, okay? Now, the last exception to the octet rule, there's really no great reason why it does it. It's just an exception. You just got to believe it and deal with it. That's oxygen, okay? So for oxygen, if you take a look at it, it's a weird scenario, but oxygen actually does not double bond to the middle like you'd expect it to. It actually has a single electron um, that is not paired on both sides, okay? In fact, if you look up oxygen online for most of your uh, examples, and you look up that, and most chemistry teachers are actually going to even ignore this as an oddity, and they will tell you it's a double bond in here. But the reality is, if you truly look up what it is, oxygen is not double bonded. It actually has a single bond with individual electrons on the outside, okay? Um, and there's the one way that we can kind of determine how this happens. Uh, it has to do with magnetism. So our next slide will kind of show you that, okay? This magnet is very strong. The poles of the magnet are one centimeter apart. Focus your attention on the poles of the magnet. The Dewar flask, or thermos, contains liquid nitrogen at a temperature of 77 kelvins. The test tube contains liquid oxygen at a temperature of 90 kelvins. The residual white solid is ice, which formed from water in the atmosphere. Okay, so as you can see, because the oxygen actually attracted the magnetic field, we know that it is paramagnetic, or we know that it actually has a single electron on it. Whereas a nitrogen that did not track to the magnetic field um, is not paramagnetic or does not do that. So this is one way that we can determine or kind of verify that oxygen has that single electron on it. All right, guys, that is formal charges. Uh, thank you. Have a good day.